Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hancock. I am the vice president of the USA chapter of the International Humanistic Management Association, who is hosting this series um, for humanistic management professionals, the Lunch and Learn. I am also the founder of a company called Humanist Learning Systems, which is the education partner for this series. My co-host today is the lovely Elizabeth Castillo. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Elizabeth at Arizona State University, and I am the secretary of the US chapter of International Humanistic Management Association. Yay. All right. So today we're going to be talking about trust. Our guest is Sean Nader, and he serves as a creative strategist for organizations that prioritize human development and, and engagement with their goals for growth. Currently, as president of Optimal Trust, Sean implements systems that promote cultures of trust and belonging, where true innovation can flourish and add to the bottom line. He is also a leader and a coach for exponential individuals, and when he's not working, he can be found practicing mindfulness on mats and through jujitsu and yoga and fundraising for women and children in the red light district of Kolkata. Sean, welcome and thanks for joining us. <laughs> thanks for having me. I, I appreciate everybody being here. Um, I should say I'm not doing the jujitsu and yoga right now. We're a recovery from a knee surgery going on beneath the desk. But uh, so first, I want to thank you, uh, Jennifer and Elizabeth, for having me. This is uh, uh, I love this group and I love, obviously, the commitment that everybody has here on the call. Um, one of the things that Jennifer told me in preparation for this was she said nobody here needs to be sold on the importance of trust and i thought that that was uh not always common usually i think as humanistic leaders we're trying to make the case for why we need to be doing this so it's just really great to be with people who we're already got it we're already up to speed on the importance of it so today we're going to jump right in and and i hope to really give you a new access to the world of trust and how it can make a difference in organizations but walk away with some really practical how to's so I'm going to I'm going to go between some slides in this and I'm um, let me just change my windows around so that there we go. I think that let me minimize here. So the first kind of logical question would be like well why trust? Well if you think about trust, trust is a critical precondition for anything that we want to do with people that's important. And when we think about organizations we take it for granted, but think of how much time and resources and training and efforts that go into all the endeavors an organization has. But if trust is missing, all of those downstream projects and initiatives and relationships all suffer. And it just becomes kind of a natural condition. And in a kind of an ironic twist, trust is rarely identified as the source of a failure. And we find it kind of pervasive in all organizations. And I kind of liken this to the role of oil in the engine of a car. You know, if you don't have oil in the engine of a car, the car overheats, the, the metal gets hot, it seizes, it cracks, and now you've got like a major repair on your hands. And where does everybody put their time and attention? It, they put it to the broken pieces. Now the money and the resource is all about fixing the, you know, the the cylinder heads, all, you know, all the technical stuff that happens in a car. But rarely do we see it as an oil issue. And if you think about how a lot of organizations work, that's where a lot of time and attention is being putting, put on mitigating the breakdowns. So trust is really getting upstream to create the conditions so that you have better downstream metrics, whether you're using KPIs or OKRs or stuff like that. So I do want to share a couple statistics just to get ourselves oriented here and right there we go so this is these are some statistics from pwc now you don't need to go in depth i know the type is a little bit small but essentially what you've got is consumer and employee feedback and if you look at the right side of the axis here you can see that trust ranks incredibly high in everything from whether I'm going to buy from a given brand to whether I'm going to be a loyal employee, whether I'm going to defend that company if something happens or recommend it to my friends, trust is very high in all of those. Another statistic here from a different point of view 
is that 58% of managers do not receive management training in companies. And if you think about what your frontline employees experience, the people are interfacing with customers, their managers are the leadership of the company for most of their day-to-day -day given purposes. So if you're having managers who aren't trained to create trust and empower employees, you can start to maybe see some of the symptoms for why employee engagement numbers, retention, all those numbers are, are so abysmal. And then the last statistic, which is really going to open up the conversation for today, is that 55% of CEOs think that a lack of trust is a threat to their organization's growth. But most have done little to increase trust, mainly because they're not sure where to start. Well, that kind of gets us into our next kind of a, a question here is, what is trust? And we do this thought experiment, both with individuals and with groups, asking them to raise their hands. Who knows what trust is? Everybody raises their hand. And they say, great, write down the definition of it. And suddenly you get a room full of very confused and hesitant people. Why? Because everybody inherently understands that trust is important, but when we go to define it, suddenly there's a lot of slippery definitions and people who even write something down, realize that what I wrote down isn't actually what I meant. And that's the kickoff for the conversation today. So I'm going to walk you through the optimal trust methodology. And what we're going to focus on today is the optimal trust grid. So optimal trust is a practical and effective model to access and address trust at all levels of an organization. And the two primary pieces we're going to focus on today is how we teach people about how to build trust. Oops, I just went backwards on my slides, didn't I? Teaching people how to build trust, and then at the organizational level, giving organizations the ability to measure trust, benchmark it, and the strategies so that they can grow it amongst at the organizational level. So let me just get to this slide here. We're going to talk about how we apply the optimal trust grid with individuals. And the first thing I'm going to just say in general is that the way we have it structured, it's a transformational learning approach so that people can develop the skills to become really good at self-assessment, assessing other people in situations, develop situational awareness, and the ability to grow trust and remediate tr breakdowns in trust. So without further ado, I'm going to get into what the grid is. And again, this is the three by three optimal trust grid. This is what we use for teaching people how to think of trust and see trust. And one of the things we would want to point out before we get into this is that statistic with the CEO said 55% of course, think that it's a threat to their business, but they don't know where to start. And the reason that most people don't know where to start is that trust itself is a descriptor. Trust, it, it describes a multiplicity of things. It might be an experience. It might be some specifics. So when I go through the optimal trust grid here, we're going to focus on the three primary components of trust that are most universal and pop up in every person's life and situation. The first of those components being competency. Obviously, for, some, for those of you watching this, it's probably really obvious. Competency, the ability to do something successfully or efficiently. We also deal with a subset of competency, which is integrity. And we're defining this one as integrity is doing what you said you would do when you said you'd do it and doing it as it was meant to be done. Now, why do we talk about integrity under competency? You could be the smartest person in your field and the best in class and the best expert. But if you don't return your emails on time or you don't do what you say you're going to do or show up to meetings on time, however good you are at your given role is going to be secondary to the fact that people don't trust that you're going to do what you say you're going to do. The next component that we focus on is aligned interests. Are your interests aligned with the other person's? Does the other person experience that your interests are aligned with theirs? And in many cases, when we're teaching this, people have never actually articulated what their interests are. And they've never had the conversation with the other person to find out what their interests are and have those conversations. 
And the same thing goes with our third component, shared values. So if what are yours, what are mine, and where do they overlap and where do they differ? So right now we're talking about three pretty easy to get universal components of trust. What makes this model really start to make an impact in how people apply it and perceive their relationships and their situations is what we call levels of self. So some of you may know this, but you know, sitting there in our chairs by ourselves as an individual, I can have whatever thoughts, opinions, competencies I want. I'm the only one impacted. If it's at the level of a relationship, I might have to then factor in my loved one, my children, my friends, whoever is applying to that situation. And then of course we enter the organizational level. And now we're talking about how my role may be dramatically be different if I'm representing an organization than if I'm just at the individual level. So if we're out to go out and grab dinner just as friends, not a big deal. That's a pretty low bar for competency or aligned interests or values. But if now we're having a work meeting and we're friends, you can see how the dynamics completely shift where your interests and your values and your competencies are vastly different than just as friends. And then, of course, we've got the last level, which is global. That refers to the a given culture or it could be the paradigm of an industry. So if you work in the pharmaceutical industry, there's a given paradigm and a structure to that and a way that business is done and the way that things are arranged. So if you're talking to somebody who values holistic health, you may have a huge discrepancy in the global level of competency or aligned interests or shared values. And so this is what you get, the three by three grid that we teach people. And they can start to look at themselves, their relationships and the situations they're dealing with in different ways and start to look at where the strengths are and where the weaknesses are. And so I'll give you this example right here. When we did this with a leading Wall Street firm, this was done with their senior advisors. Of course, you can kind of uh, imagine in a place like that, if there's a breakdown in trust between a senior advisor and a client, like an investor, you might have 25 to $50 million suddenly leaving. And by the time you go to address it, it's far too late. So optimal trust was being used to get upstream so that they were not suffering those losses and they were creating more trust upfront. But this was being used as a self-assessment. So when the individual, the, the advisor themselves was asked, do you think your client thinks you're competent? Of course they said, well, yes, of course they think I'm competent. But do they think the, or the, the firm is competent? On that one, they said, well, not really. There was just a, 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 there was a scandal in the newspaper as they know your reputation. Well, do they trust Wall Street? And you can see the scores are abysmally lower. And you can see that track over the aligned interests and the shared values. Now, if you're an advisor and you can now have this new view and a new lens into this is how I think my clientele views me and the organization and the industry I'm in, that gives me an access to do see what actions I could take to remediate that. If you're the financial firm, you could really see a weak point here. If I'm a, if I'm the head of a financial firm and I see these numbers, I'm going to see that, wow, my, my financial advisors could literally leave tomorrow and their clientele would follow them out the door and go to the firm across the street. So I'll get into a little bit more just after this about how we do this at the organizational level in a far more sophisticated way as well. But when you talk about what these financial advisors were experiencing, this is a, a, a practical grid that uh, I had a client call a Trojan horse for soft skills. Because what people end up engaging in this with is they start to examine their relationships and the situations in their life and they start having new conversations. So first, the advisors got a whole new lens and a language for, the, for those relationships, and they reported seeing the world a whole new way, and it gave them an access. And if you think about it, we can't access what we can't articulate. So this simple model gave people a new way to articulate their environment. And through doing that, they discovered direct ways that they could alter their actions and the conversations. Just in addressing with their clientele, hey, you know, I have 
I, I make a, a commission off of this interaction. You know, if I sell you something, would you want to have a conversation about that? So you know that I'm taking care of your needs. Just in being able to have that conversation, people said, I built trust right there with the person. That means they were able to solve issues before they became conflicts. And there was also some surprise benefits where people started to report back how this was impacting their more personal relationships with their spouse and their children. Why? Because they had access to a new view that was allowing them to take new actions and have new conversations. So that's a quick overview of the, the three by three trust grid. And the last po uh, bullet point that I showed you at the beginning of this was measuring, benchmarking, and growing trust in organizations. And I'm not going to spend too much time on that today just for the sake of time, but we use a series of surveys that can be very specifically targeted around different issues so that organizations can ask questions about their employees and get very detailed feedback on human sentiment, discovering unvoiced issues. And what that really does is instead of an organization just saying, hey, we need to deal with this as an emergency and go take bold and decisive action, but not knowing which direction they're going in, this gives you very detailed information that gives you insight into where you need to drill down more and to create the strategy so you can benchmark that and start to remediate over time, knowing that you could actually measure this quarter by quarter, year by year, whatever works best. And that we're talking about measuring human sentiment across organizations, diagnosing underlying issues, addressing unspoken issues, and benchmarking those for remediation. I think for the sake of time, I'm going to stop it there, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs>